Hello, my name is Brookie and I am a trout. I live here in this stream with my family and friends. This stream is an amazing place to have for a habitat. There are lots of critters, plenty to eat, so much to see and is very interesting because things are often changing. Sometimes it is hard though, mainly because humans do things that make our waters too warm or unclean. If only they knew more about the importance of streams. Bennett Science Kids. Bennett the Science Kids. Science, 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 science. Bennett Science Kids. Science News. Science. Catskill Mountains were formed 350 million years ago during the Devonian period. E equals MC squared. The anemometer measures wind speed. Raccoons are omnivores. Human body is composed of multiple systems working in harmony to keep you alive. Evaporation leads to condensation, resulting in precipitation. A stream is a body of water with a current that moves by flowing through a channel. Many streams start out high on a mountainside as a small trickle of water. These tiny streams are known as rills or streamlets. Streams increase in size as they flow downhill. When smaller streams come together, they create larger streams such as brooks. Brooks merge together to form creeks, which eventually empty into rivers that ultimately end up in the ocean. The bottom of the stream is known as the bed. The bed of this stream is very rocky. The sides of a stream are called the banks. When a stream fills up to the top of the bank, it is said to be bankful. If the stream rises any further, it will spill over its banks or flood. The flat areas along the sides of a stream are known as the floodplain. This is the place where water naturally goes during high water flows. Look, this is evidence of flooding. Some streams flow only during heavy rain or after snow melt. These streams are called intermittent streams. Perennial streams are those that flow all year long. Streams are dynamic. This means they're always changing. They can go from slow and shallow, or even dry, to powerful and fast, within a few days or just hours after a storm or a quick snow melt. Streams can be beautiful, but they can also be destructive. While they are great places to fish, play and explore, they are not good places to build houses or other buildings. Without warning, a stream can wash away a bank or change directions after a major storm. This happened to several towns in upstate New York during Hurricane Irene. Did you know? Stream bank erosion is common during the times of high water flow. This can lead to a stream condition known as turbidity, which is when the water looks cloudy or dirty. A turbidity tube can be used to measure how clear the water is. It works by filling the tube with water and then looking down the tube to see if you can see the black and white pattern at the bottom. When you see the pattern, you record the level of the water in the tube. If the water is turbid, you may have to let the water out of the tube until you can see the pattern. The results can be analyzed later back at school. Persistent turbidity can negatively impact water quality within a stream ecosystem. Turbidity is one of the bigger concerns affecting water quality within the New York City water supply system. Here in the Ashokan watershed, numerous stream restoration projects have been completed with the goal of reducing the amount of stream bank sediment entering the stream. As a result, stream turbidity levels are lower, thus improving the overall quality of the drinking water. Now you know. Trout in the Classroom is an environmental education program sponsored by Trout Unlimited. Participating classes raise trout from eggs to young fish called fry. 
At the end of the school year, students will release the fish into nearby approved streams. During the year, students learn all about water quality, natural resources, stream ecosystems, and about how to be good stewards of the environment. Today, we are going to visit a typical class to learn about their trout in the classroom program. Hi, I'm Jordan, and welcome to Mrs. Wolfram's second grade class. I began raising trout in the classroom about uh, 13 or 14 years ago. Uh, a dear friend of mine was the originator of Trout in the Classroom here at the Phoenicia School, and she convinced me that it was a worthwhile project. Um, I, I realized that we live in a watershed, and in order to become good stewards of the watershed that we live in, kids needed to have a vested interest. And by raising trout from eggs to sack fry to fingerlings, they followed the whole process of, of the trout life cycle so that when we release them into the stream, we need to know that the stream is, is healthy and clean and trout are a huge indicator of the health of a stream. So over the course of the years, children have become avid stewards of, of what it's like to, to live in an environment that's clean and safe and, and healthy. Um, and also learned along the way that the, the reservoir that we live near, the watershed, um, provides eight million people in New York City with fresh, unfiltered drinking water. So in order to protect the environment so that people in New York City will be able to turn on their faucets and get good, clean, pure water, it all started with learning a lesson about trout in our classroom. Hi, my name is Sage and I'm going to tell you about the life cycle of a brook trout. First, the female builds a nest called a red. Then she spawns the, the eggs. Then the eggs start to develop. Then the eyed eggs. Then their eyed eggs. Then the embryo. Then soon it will hatch and become an alvin or a sack fry. Then it's a fingerling. Then it's an adult female. Well, it's adult male. And if and when it's adult male, it has like it has a little hook. Uh, and then the female builds her nest again and then she spawns her eggs and then they go in the cycle again. Hi, my name is Sarah and I'm going to tell you all the parts about the trout. This is the kite that tells if it's a female or a male. This is the eye to help it see. The gills help it breathe. The fins help it steer. And the tail helps it move and steer and the lateral line helps it sense things. Hi, my name's Anastas. And my name is Cooper. And we are going to demonstrate how the fish sense things with their lateral line. So first we're going to take some sand and we're going to put it on this um, rubber with the bucket. Next we're going to test if the sand jumps up. And that demonstrates how the fish use their lateral lines to detect sound waves. Hi, I'm Calvin. These are our trout. Uh, this is the chiller. It keeps uh, the tank cold. Uh, this is the uh, filter. It keeps the tank clean. Uh, these are fingerlings. We have raised them since October. Uh, it's now May. We will release them soon.
often visited for recreational purposes. Common uses include fishing, boating, swimming, painting, and picnicking. Sometimes people misuse streams by leaving behind litter, fishing gear, and other belongings. We should all be sure to take home everything we bring with us while having fun at the stream. Hey Jack, it's been raining all week and I wanted to know if you wanted to go play by the stream with me. Do your parents know we'll be down there? No, but I'm allowed to go play by the stream whenever I want. I don't know, Vincent. I learned in watershed detectors that uh, we, you should be careful when investigating streams. Okay. Stream investigation safety tips. Never investigate a stream by yourself. Make sure a grown-up knows where you are at all times. Check stream conditions before heading into the water. Do not investigate during fast moving or unsafe water conditions. Avoid going into the water that is above your knees. Stream water may look calm at the surface, but swift moving underwater current can easily knock you off your feet. Always wear boots or closed toe water shoes in the water as sharp objects on the bottom of the stream can cut your feet. Never walk, play, or climb on slippery rocks or logs. Stay away from bottoms of waterfalls regardless of how calm or shallow the water appears. Hazards within the stream are not always obvious. Avoid debris and trees that have fallen into the water. Do not stay in cold water too long. Even during hot temperatures, cold stream water can cause hypothermia very quickly. Treat all wildlife, including bugs, that you collect with care. When you're done with your investigations, put them back where you found Uh-oh, uh-oh, oh, uh -oh. A section of a stream can be separated into a series of parts known as ripples, runs, and pools. Riffles are the areas of a stream where the water is shallow and runs fast. They are often found over rough beds made of gravel, cobbles, and boulders. The constant splashing makes riffles the most oxygenated areas of a stream and therefore makes them home to a wide diversity of invertebrates and fish. A run is a fast moving section of a stream that occurs where the water is not shallow enough to cause splashing or rippling at the surface. Pools are the ponds of water located in slow moving sections of the stream. They often occur where water piles up before going through a riffle. Consider the following. Many of our local streams are being negatively affected by invasive species. Invasive species are non-native plants and animals that can cause harm to an environment. They are often accidentally brought here from other parts of the world. Because they have no natural predators in their new location, invasive populations grow quickly and can outcompete native species for resources. This can be very disruptive to a local ecosystem. The hemlock woolly adelgid is an insect that feeds on eastern hemlock trees. It arrived here from Asia on infested landscape plants. These insects lay their eggs in woolly-like sacs at the base of hemlock needles. These sacs look like the end of the Q-tip. When the eggs hatch, the insects attach themselves to the tree where they remain for the rest of their lives, feeding on the starches stored within the tree. In doing so, the woolly adelgid steals the nutrients meant for the tree limbs and needles. This often leads to the death of the tree. This can be a problem for streams. Hemlock trees often grow on slopes near the edges of streams, which helps keep the banks stable. Hemlocks also provide shade to streams, which keeps the water cool. Many species of trout prefer this. The loss of hemlock trees because of the woolly adelgids has already had a negative impact on stream bank erosion and native trout species here in New York State. Another type of invasive species that can have a negative impact on the streams is called didymo. Didymo, commonly known as rock snot, is a brownish algae that grows in thick mats that can be spread over entire stream beds. 
In doing so, it covers over native organisms and restricts the availability of food for native fish species. Rock snot spreads quickly and easily by attaching to the boots and waders of fly fishermen. If not cleaned off properly between outings, it will spread to the next body of water they go to. Today's program is brought to you by Rock Snot. Coming to a stream bed near you. Yo, yo, diddy mo, diddy mo. Yo, yo, diddy mo. Rock Snot! Yo, yo, diddy mo, diddy mo. Yo, yo, diddy mo. Rock Snot! Don't spread it or you'll regret it. Clean streams, just forget it. Yo, yo, diddy mo, diddy mo. Japanese knotweed is another invasive species causing problems for streams. It is a large perennial plant with a hollow stem which looks similar to bamboo. Native to most of East Asia, it was brought to the U.S. as an ornamental garden plant in the 1800s. It now commonly grows wild in the riparian areas along many streams in the eastern United States. The plant forms thick, dense colonies that often shade and crowd out native plant species. This reduces native plant diversity and alters the natural ecosystem. Because the ground under knotweed thickets is bare, the soil is very susceptible to erosion. Once established, Japanese knotweed is very hard to get rid of. The best way to control it is to pull up young plants or dig out the root system of mature plants. Hey Kai, are you going to the Stream Explorers Youth Adventure? Yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun. And I'm really looking forward to learning all about streams.
Yeah. Well, don't drink this. Yeah, don't, I know. Don't drink this. Yeah, I know, but we could. But then we'll... Hi, I'm Sadie, and I'm here at the Stream Explorers Youth Adventures talking to kids about the importance of streams. Why do you think streams are important? Um, streams are important because they can help start a food chain. It helps species like fish and crayfish survive in the water. And if we didn't have any streams, well, that would not give us any water. Because they provide a meaningful habitat for animals. All the other wildlife in the world needs water to survive. They help the food chain. And if we didn't have water, we would all be dead. The area along the sides of a stream are known as the riparian zone. This is where the stream interacts with the land and vegetation growing along the stream. It is also known as the stream corridor. Vegetation in this zone is specially adapted to withstand flooding. Streams are healthiest when they are we're surrounded by forests and wetlands. Mammals such as mink, otters, muskrats, and beavers spend all of their time in or near the water, using the riparian vegetation for shelter and food. Other land mammals, like raccoons, dine on aquatic organisms such as fish, frogs, and crayfish. Many animals use the stream corridor as a means of travel from one habitat or wild area to another. It is a safe way for them to avoid humans and their activities. Animals spotlight. The American beaver is the largest rodent in North America. Rodents have four large orange front teeth called incisors. These teeth never stop growing, which is why rodents are constantly chewing. Beavers use their sharp teeth to chew down tall trees so that they can get at the small branches in the tops of trees. Beavers are herbivores, which means they only eat plant material. Their primary food source is the undersides of tree bark. They nibble at the branches and strip them clean, sort of like eating corn on the cob. When they are done with the sticks, they use them to build their homes called lodgers or to build dams across streams to create ponds. They can often be seen at dawn and dusk but they are nocturnal, which means they sleep during the day and are active at night. Beavers spend most of their time in the water. They are excellent swimmers and can hold their breath for a long time. Their bodies are specially adapted to life in the water. They have thick, oily fur to keep them warm and dry. They have see-through eyelids that serve as goggles when they go under the water. Their back feet are webbed to help them swim fast. Their amazing tails help them steer while swimming and are often used to slap the water when danger is near. We often find evidence of beavers along streams. Common signs include beaver lodges and dams, chewed trees, brush chips, incisor marks, pointed tree trunk tips, and tracks in the mud on stream banks. Beavers are known as keystone species, which means they have the ability to alter or change an ecosystem. By making ponds, they create aquatic habitats for a wide variety of living things. Some people consider the beavers to be a nuisance because of the damage they can cause, particularly to the trees surrounding the waters they inhabit. Here we see lots of evidence of beavers. Across the stream, we see a beaver log. Hi, I'm Allison Lent. I work with Ulster County Soil and Water Conservation District with the Ashokan Watershed Stream Management Program. I am a fluvial geomorphologist, and what that means is I study how streams move water, move sediment, they sh how they shape the landscape. Today we are here along Maltby Hollow Creek in the town of Olive. Eventually, 
This water goes to New York City for use as drinking water. We are all set up here to do a survey of the stream. And I am here working with my coworker, Tiffany Runge. She's gonna be helping me out. And we are set up here to do a cross section of the channel. We have run a tape along the, across the channel here, and we are using a total station to get the elevation shots. And it's actually a robotic total station. So it will follow us around following this prism right here. And what it will do is it'll shoot a laser from the total station to the prism and then back, bounce it back to the total station. And it will record the difference in elevation from our prism to the total station. So we're actually gonna get some elevation shots all the way across the channel, trying to get all the breaks and slopes and trying to really capture the shape of the channel. And ultimately what this will tell us is give us the width of the channel, give us the cross-sectional areas. And it'll give us a lot of information about the hydraulics and what the flow is doing in the channel. I became a scientist and got into this line of work because probably as a child, I was always really interested in the outdoors and kind of trying to understand why the landscape looks the way that it does, you know, in the streams, going hiking around, exploring in the woods. Uh, so I was just really particularly attracted to the environmental sciences. And in school, I always did really well in math and physics and all the other science fields that I just kept pursuing it. I thought it was enjoyable and the further I got in life, the more I kind of went in the direction of stream science. How cool it is to just get out and play in the water all the time. And I strongly encourage more girls to get interested in this stuff, to get out there, explore their streams, to explore their environment around them. Other than what you saw us doing earlier today with the cross section, uh, we do a lot of project monitoring. I am out in the field doing more cross sections and long pros to try and monitor some of our restoration projects that we've done in the past, see how they're performing, seeing if they're if we were successful in meeting our goal and stabilizing the stream and hiking way up in the mountains with a GPS like this and mapping things like bank erosion, where there might be some wood in the channel, where we're seeing some deposition happening. The favorite part of my job is definitely going to be when we get out here and do all this field work. Getting out here and playing in the streams, uh, getting our hands dirty, getting our feet wet, that is a lot of fun. It's uh, getting the fresh air, enjoying the outdoors. The big reason why I got into this line of work is because there's the opportunity to get out here and collect data. So studying streams, like what we're doing out here today, it's all really important, really useful uh, to gain that knowledge and help out landowners that live next to the stream, to help out the local towns uh, manage their roads and their culverts and bridges, uh, help out other municipalities to make decisions is, which could have a major impact on the stream. Hey Vincent, what are you up to? I'm using a Tremble GPS unit. What's that? It's a portable global positioning device that we learned how to use in Watershed Detectives Club this year. How does it work? It allows us to pinpoint interesting features of the stream that can be used to make detailed maps. Wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. Can you teach me how to use it? Sure, let's go. Wow, we sure have learned a lot in Watershed Detectives Club this year. Yeah, I never realized how important streams are. Science rules! What? Produced with the support of the Ashokan Watershed Stream Management Program, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Ulster County, and the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Streams are important because they can supply water for families. They can 
support wildlife and provide for humans. Because they provide the habitat. Yes, they kind of like keep the ecosystem in balance. And if there weren't any streams, like nothing would really like survive. Because sometimes they can provide power for families. To support wildlife, uh, they're important to animals that live in the stream and animals on land for drinking and food. Because many people use streams for recreational use. Because animals that live in the stream, they give them a place to live. Some animals need them to live, like fish. Because they help the environment around. It provides animals habitats. Because they provide resources for drinking water. They provide places for picnics, and you can swim there. Because they hold lots of animals.